Psalm 77, starting at verse 13, I want to read, Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? Of course, there are no other gods. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeem your people and descend in the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. That's us, church. God is great. He is mighty. Our God is greater. <laughs> Turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like darkness you rise out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you no none like you declare it church how God is greater how God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power our God Hey, what? 
stop us, and it gets. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? You can clap. I know it seems silly in your bedroom or your, your front of the TV. Come on, clap. Bless the Lord. God, you're awesome. God, you're worthy. There is no one, no one like you, Lord God. And we absolutely love you, Lord. Thank you.
Doesn't it feel good to worship him? God, there's no greater love. No one, no one can stand up against you, Lord God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. If you were in this room right now, I'd have you praise. We're going to do that again. Come on, bless the Lord. He's so good. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice right where you are and bless our God. You are so wonderful, Lord. Thank you. Straight a highway, path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Go back the sinners, break up the saints. Let every nation shout of your praise. Yeah. Jesus is coming soon. Church ready for you, every heart longing for our King. We sing, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come, even so, come, Lord Jesus. justice all will be new your name forever faithful and true yeah jesus is coming soon oh like a bride waiting for a groom we'll be a church ready for you every heart longing for Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come. Lord Jesus, come. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, you're coming soon. Oh, lift your hands up where you are and sing it. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, you're coming soon. Oh, yes, Lord. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait. Come, Lord, please come. 
Something happens when you take your eyes off a situation that you're facing. And you look deep. Deep into Scripture. We know that Jesus is the Word of God. Turn your upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory to the eyes of my Jesus oh and worship him sing it with me turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the thing In the 
things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let your grace fall, Lord. We need it. Your grace abounds to us, Lord. Your favor abounds to us, Lord. Your mercy is new every morning. Every day, Lord, I can count on you. Every day as I read your word, I look into the eyes of a merciful Savior. First, Lord, I keep you first. And the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory. stand in the presence of God right now sickness God is touching you right at the point of that sickness he's healing you right now oh he's ministering to you by his spirit pour your spirit out on all flesh Lord be renewed in him the Lord God says be renewed Lift your hands and receive the blessing of the Lord. His financial blessings coming this week. He's pouring out to you. So don't you fear, don't you worry, cast it all onto him. Cast it onto him. In the light of his glory. Hi, Pastor Barry here, and uh, today I'm coming to you from Veterans Memorial Park in Oldsmar. And uh, on this Memorial Day weekend, I wanted to uh, take some time to uh, pray here for uh, families who've lost sons and daughters in combat. Um, here at the park, we have this beautiful memorial uh, that's been erected to uh, the, those who've served in foreign wars. It's Veterans Memorial Park. Uh, but there is one name of a young man on the wall here, uh, Frank Gross. And the special thing about Frank is that uh, Frank was in Mine and Trace's youth group. Um, 
and uh, he and his sister. Uh, he was also a friend of my son Andrew's. Uh, Frank is the only name on this wall of anyone who's actually lost their life in combat who was from Oldsmar. His parents are dear friends to us, um, Craig and Tony Gross, and uh, we just love the family. Uh, they actually head up um, the Gold Star Families group here for the state of Florida. Gold Star Families are those who have lost a son or daughter in active combat. So I wanted to take a moment right now just to pray uh, as we're here on this Memorial Day for these families. So Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we ask God that you would minister a peace to those who've lost a son or daughter. Lord, that their sons and daughters responded to that call that you placed in their heart to stand in harm's way. Lord, it wasn't just harm's way for America's sake, Lord, but for those uh, countries, Lord, around the world who didn't have the ability to stand up against tyranny and injustice. So Lord, our sons and our daughters responded and Lord, some of them paid that ultimate sacrifice and gave their all for people they didn't even know. And Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just bless them today. Bless these families that have been left behind. Bless the sons and the daughters who've grown up without a mother or father. Bless the husbands and wives who lost a spouse. Bless the moms and dads who lost a child, Lord, uh, serving in these foreign wars. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that you would bless them, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you'd minister a peace today that would pass all understanding to those who've lost a loved one. And God, we pray that as we move forward, that we would never forget, would never forget the sacrifice that these have made for our freedoms and for our sake. And I pray, Lord God, you continue to put in the hearts of sons and daughters to step up, to rise up, to respond to that call, or to stand in harm's way and to be agents of justice here at home and around the world. God, we give you glory and honor and praise for all you're doing in our midst. It's in your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hello, church family. Just wanted to let you know, in case you've not heard, that we are reopening the church doors Saturday, June 6th and Sunday, June 7th, and we're so excited about seeing you face to face. We are following the CDC guidelines, so there is reserved seating that you need to do ahead of time. You'll find the link for the Eventbrite um, site where you can reserve your seating here on Facebook, you can on the website, the app, and then also that week, watch for the other things that are going to start meeting again at the church. Wednesday, midweek, um, Bible study with Pastor Tom. We have youth group. We have prayer. A couple of connect groups are going to get together. So be sure to check out the event calendar and, and let's reconnect. It's going to be a great time. And then we are going to continue with the reservation for the church services through the month of June. And then um, thank you again for your faithfulness with the tithes and the offering. You'll see on the screen how you can continue to give, but God bless you, um, you and your family as, as you just continue to pour out. So with that, um, can't wait to see you. Enjoy the rest of the service. God bless. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to New Hope Church. Pastor Nick here. So glad to have you joining us online today for our cyber church weekend. Uh, we have been so blessed by uh, the response of people who've been watching online and so delighted that you're here with us today. So let's open up our hearts to the Lord. Let's pray and let's get into the word. Father, we want to thank you for your great grace, for your mercy, for your life, for your love and for your presence, Lord. Uh, God, we hold up the word of the Lord and we thank you, God, that your word is life and truth. Let your word speak to our hearts Help us to hear what you want to say and walk it out in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus and turn with me to chapter 32. Exodus 32, I'll begin reading in verse 1. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said. Make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land 
of Egypt. We're in the fourth and final week of our journey through the wilderness. We've been focusing on Romans 8, 28 and 29. Such an important truth that you must grasp in your heart and understand with your mind and by faith apprehend because it's, it, it, it is critical for you to understand these things if you're going to understand God's working in our lives. Let's read these two verses. And as a matter of fact, let me encourage you, read them out loud. Uh, read along with me. Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I want you to pay close attention to two things. First and foremost, you and I and all believers are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Matter of fact, if you're sitting with somebody, turn to them and tell them, God's working on you. He is. He's working on you. He's working on me. We're all construction projects. God is working on us to conform us into the image of his son. He's predestined us to be like Jesus in attitude and behavior and eventually in glory. Yeah, that's right. He's working on our attitudes. He's doing things to work on the preconceived ideas and attitudes of our hearts and minds about the world around us and about him personally. He's confronting the value system that we've been operating on when we came out of the world. You come out of the world and you have certain values and those values now change in the kingdom of God. He's trying to adjust our attitudes and our ideas and our values so that we look more, think more, speak more and act more like Jesus. Yeah, he's working on our attitudes and when he changes our attitudes in the way we think, it should change our behavior. Yeah, he's, he's working on changing our behavior. If you know he's working on your behavior, you can just say, ouch, oh me, yeah, that's right, my behavior does need to change. You know that brick wall you keep running into? There's a reason it's there. Yeah, God put it there. See, you, if you keep trying to do things your way and not his way, you're going to hit that brick wall because God wants to show you a better way. So he's working on our attitudes, our behaviors. He's conforming us into the image of Jesus so that we'll become more like him, so we'll reflect the beauty of who God is to the world around us. And then the second thing that's important to understand and remember is the all things in Romans 8, 28. All things means everything. Everything in your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, God uses in our lives. He uses the, those wonderful mountaintop experiences when we're walking in victory and everything's really going great in life. He's do, using the uh, everyday ordinary things and even the crisis and the hard times and the harsh times and the dry times in our lives. He uses all of it because he's a redeemer. And he wants to redeem every part of our life so that we will be more like Jesus. Our focus for these past few weeks has been what I've entitled the wilderness experience. Simply put, a wilderness experience is a dry, difficult time in life. It's a time when the normal comforts that you have are removed. When, when your prayer life and your reading the word, and the, they're just dry times. You're not getting out what you used to get out. You're not, you're not sensing and feeling the presence of the Lord. They're difficult times. And when you're in a wilderness, you're going to face certain temptations. Just like Jesus did when he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit for 40 days before he entered into his ministry. There were temptations he overcame in the wilderness and 
uh, you and I are going to face certain temptations when we go through those dry and difficult times in life. Three weeks ago, we talked about the temptation of fear. And two weeks ago, we talked about the temptation of frustration. Last week, we talked about the temptation of fixation. And all those messages are online, and if you haven't heard them, I would encourage you to go back and listen to them. Each one provides some important truth to help you when you go through difficult times in life. Today, we're going to deal with the temptation of forsaking. Now, the dictionary defines forsaking as to give up, to break off, to renounce, to desert, or abandon. When you're in a wilderness experience in life, you're going to face this same temptation. Moses went up to the mountain to get direction from God. In Exodus 24, 18, it says, Then Moses disappeared into the cloud as he climbed higher up the mountain. He remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And then in Exodus 31, 18, when the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. Moses and his assistant Joshua went up to the mountain of God along with the 70 elders. Moses then went further up the mountain and entered the cloud of God's glory on top of the mountain and he would not be seen again for 40 days and 40 nights. During this time, he received all the instructions on how to build the tabernacle in the wilderness, all the covenant of God, the commandments, all of that was given to him, and it was written out on two stone tablets by the finger of God. Boy, can you imagine that experience? I can't. It's indescribable. While Moses was on the top of the mountain, the people were below waiting. And really to understand what was taking place, I think it's good to go back and look what happened, what was going on before Moses went up to the top of that mountain. Turn back in your Bibles to Exodus 24 and look with me in verse 9. Exodus 24 and verse 9. Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel climbed up the mountain. There they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there seemed to be a surface of brilliant blue lapis lazuli, as clear as the sky itself. And though these nobles of Israel gazed upon God, he did not destroy them. In fact, they ate a covenant meal, eating and drinking in his presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain." Stay there and I will give you the tablets of stone on which I have inscribed the instructions and commands so you can teach the people. So Moses and his assistant Joshua set out and Moses climbed up the mountain of God. Moses told the elders, stay here and wait for us until we come back. Aaron and her are here with you. If anyone has a dispute while I'm gone, consult with them. Then Moses climbed up the mountain and the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. What an amazing, awesome sight. Can you imagine what the people of Israel, the elders, what they all experienced looking at what was taking place, the sight of the cloud and the consuming fire. It was an awesome sight. And so the children of Israel waited. And they waited eagerly. They knew Moses was meeting with God. The elders who had seen God told them that God called Moses and Aaron, uh, Moses and Uh, Joshua up to the top of the mountain. They knew that God was preparing. God was doing something. But a few days turned into a week, and a week, two weeks, and two weeks, a month. And as the days passed, it seemed like nothing was happening. And while nothing seemed to be happening, the pressure of waiting on God brought on the next temptation of forsaking. 
You know, it's hard for me to imagine as I ponder what took place. They saw God's glory cover the mountain. The elders, Aaron and Ur and his sons, all heard and saw God. And yet, even with people who could witness to the fact that God was real and at work and doing something on their behalf to prepare them for the promised land, the waiting became unbearable. You might say to yourself, well, you know, if I was there, that wouldn't have happened to me. I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't have given up. Really? How many of us pray and seek God's direction or provision or his intervention in a matter? And maybe you're in a, in a worship service or maybe you're in your own private moments with God and God speaks to you clearly through his word and he speaks a promise to you and he tells you that he's at work and he's doing something, he's gonna get it done and, and you have great faith in that moment and you know that, it's, that God spoke and it was clear to you. And then we anticipate that healing or that deliverance or that provision or whatever it may be that you prayed for. And when you first had faith, you, you just were excited and professed that God was working and doing something and he's moving and, and he's moving now. And a day turns into a week and a week into a month and a month into years. The glory that came on you in that private moment or in that worship service now is faded. The revelation you received in your spirit that God had spoken to you has grown dim. The faith that had once given you hope has now grown into doubt. And really, the only thing that changed was time. Waiting. Let's face it, we don't, we don't like to wait. We zoom around older people who are driving the speed limit only to pull up to a stoplight and here they come, putt, 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 and sitting right next to you in a hurry to go nowhere fast. My generation, the boomer generation, oh God forgive us, uh, we, we really don't like to wait. We're responsible for creating microwave onion uh, ovens and fast food restaurants and, and uh instant mashed potatoes. We created Disney Line. Disneyland, Disney World. Yeah, that's right. Where, where families can go and spend thousands of dollars to wait in line for a little puppet to sing It's a Small World After All. We don't like waiting. And all the advertisements on TV tell you you don't have to wait. Uh, you deserve it now. You know, you, you want new furniture for your house? Come on down to Rooms to Go. Buy it now. No payments for a year and a half. How much credit do you need? No problem. And what happens is millions of people are servicing debt that now requires both husband and wife to work to try and service a debt instead of waiting till you could afford to purchase it with the money you've saved. After so long of waiting on God, some folks begin to drift and walk away from the Lord, forsake the Lord. Be careful of this temptation. You know, some of you have been waiting for a long time, praying for a spouse. You're single and you just so desperately desire to have a family and, and be married and, and, and share just intimacies with another person in your life and and you pray and you believe and, and it's just not happening and you don't see it coming. And, and then over the course of time, you've been waiting so long, you start to drift. Some people, you know, praying for a new job or financial breakthrough or healing or direction. I don't know what it is, what you've been expecting from God to do, but it's been a long time of praying and waiting. You're losing hope, you're drifting, and sometimes when you're waiting too long, you think, well, I, I've got to take things into my own hands. So we begin to compromise our convictions and our standards. What we used to know to be clearly wrong, we now do in order to change the circumstance because we're tired of waiting on God. 
I remember this was years ago when I was uh, pastoring the singles at Countryside Christian Center. It was the first uh, main ministry that, that I uh, pioneered at the church. And uh, we had uh, singles that would come. We, we had uh, about 100 singles on an average Sunday coming to Sunday school. And uh, there was a, one girl I remember in particular. I'll call her Debbie. And uh, Debbie was faithful. She was faithful in church. She was a woman of faith. She prayed. She believed. She had a vibrant relationship with the Lord. One day she uh, came to my office for counsel, and she, uh, she, she wanted to be married so badly. And she'd been praying and believing and, and just shared her deep desire to have a family. She'd done all she was supposed to do. She was praying, believing. She even fasted. You know, but it seemed there was just no, no prospect in sight. And I encouraged her, look, Debbie, stay faithful to the Lord. Trust God. God will bring it about in his timing. He's preparing you. He's preparing that other person. Wait on the Lord. It wasn't long, and Debbie disappeared from fellowship. Didn't see her. Didn't see her again for several years, as a matter of fact. And then one day I was at the altar after church praying with people, and I saw this woman in line, frail, uh, looked sickly. She came up to me and she said, uh, Pastor, I don't know if you remember me, but I'm, I'm Debbie. I used to be in your singles ministry. And when I saw her, she was unrecognizable to me. And then she told me her story. She told me that the day she came to see me in the office, she had just met a man at a bar. He was a nice man. He was a kind person. He, he was caring toward her. And after a very short courtship, they married. And after they married, a short time later, the man confessed to her that he had AIDS. Two years later, he passed away. And now Debbie was standing before me, and she had full-blown AIDS. Waiting on the Lord is really important in our spiritual lives, and it impacts our personal lives. See, it's in those times of waiting when you don't see anything changing in the physical realm that God is working in the invisible realm. He may be doing something in you. He may be doing something in other people, preparing things to come together at just the right time. One of my favorite uh, psalms is Psalm 37. I want to read a part of this passage because it, it speaks to this whole idea of the importance of waiting and trusting on God. In Psalm 37, verse 1, Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. You know, for those of you particularly who are single and you've been waiting for a long time and, and, and you've been asked to be in other people's wedding parties many times, you've been the best man or the maid of honor, but never the bride or the groom. Don't envy other people. Don't don't allow your spirit to to covet what others have. Rejoice in the goodness of God working in their lives and know that God's working in yours as well. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday. So trust, delight, and commit. Be still in the presence of the Lord, verse 7, and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Stop being angry. Stop being angry about the circumstance of your life. Turn from your rage. Don't lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. 
Verse 25, once I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. Verse 34, put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along his path. He will honor you by giving you the land. You will see the wicked destroyed. Verse 37, look at those who are honest and good, for a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. But the rebellious will be destroyed. They have no future. The Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them, and they find shelter in him. In the wilderness at Mount Sinai, the children of Israel forsook God and made a golden calf. They began to worship the work of their own hands. They created a God and said that it had delivered them from Egypt. In other words, we got out by our own, our own strength and savvy. That's what they were basically saying. At the foot of the mountain of God, they turned away from God who could take them into the promised land. The scripture doesn't tell us how long it took before their impatience got the better of them. Was it three days or 10 days or 29 days or 35 days? But at some point during the 40-day wait, they fell to the temptation and drifted and forsook their hope, their salvation, and their deliverer. And you may think God has gotten all about, uh, all about, he's forgotten all about you and your situation, but uh, You know, just because you're not hearing clearly, just because you don't feel his presence, just because you don't see the demonstration of his uh, power doesn't mean that he's abandoned you in the wilderness. Don't drift. Don't turn away. Wait on him. He's got a plan. He's working it out. Give him the time that he needs to do what he's trying to do in you and through you. That day back in the wilderness, The children of Israel made a decision. They took off their earrings and made a golden calf and they forsook God. I want to show you another choice that you can make in the wilderness. In Exodus 21 and verse 2, if you buy a Hebrew slave, he may serve no more than six years. Set him free in the seventh year and he will owe you nothing for his freedom. But the slave may declare, I love my master, my wife, and my children. I don't want to go free. And if he does this, his master must present him before God. Then the master must take him to the door or doorpost and publicly pierce his ear with an awl. After that, the slave will serve his master for life. See, the servant who refused to leave his master's household, even though he could, was called a bond slave or a love slave. This servant had determined that it would be better to live in the household of his master than out in the world. How about you? I know things are tough. Things have been difficult these past couple of months, going on three months with this pandemic, the government shutdown, the impact that it's had on many of us. I know you've been waiting a long time for your deliverer to come down off the mountaintop. You haven't seen any reason to hope lately. And the people around you are saying, take off your golden earring and let's make a calf. Today, the Lord has a hammer and an awl in his hand. Are you willing, despite what you see in the circumstances of your life, despite what you feel, to say to the Lord, I love you, Lord. And I will serve you all the days of my life. Today, I believe the Lord will seal your commitment to him. You may think, I don't know if I can make a commitment like that. I've been through so much. Well, Romans 14.4 gives you promise there. Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. God will help you to honor your commitment to him. One last thing about the wilderness. You might not feel his presence. You may not hear his voice clearly. 
You may not see the demonstration of his power, but he is there, just like he was with the children of Israel as they walked through the wilderness. Exodus 13, verse 21, the Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with the pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. The Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. I just want to remind you, friend, that while you are waiting on the Lord, God is at work. Please don't grow impatient. Don't don't allow yourself to fall into temptation and to begin to drift away from the Lord. No, it's in those times when you don't feel the feeling. If you'll lift holy hands and worship the Lord, if you'll continue to pray and be persistent in your prayer and not give up even though you're not getting the answer, to continue to pray. Continue to trust. Continue to praise. Continue to believe. And you will see the hand of the Lord move in your life. And God will give you the grace for the time of waiting. Let's close in a word of prayer. Precious Lord, I pray for all of those who are going through a challenging time right now in a wilderness experience in life. And Lord, I pray that you would give special grace as we wait upon you for the answer, Lord, that we would not allow ourselves to drift away, but we would draw nearer to you. And we would declare our trust and our love for you and our commitment to you. And we would follow you, Lord, however you lead us. Even we, when we can't see clearly and we're not certain about what to do, God, we trust you will show us every day what we need to do. So God, bless your people. Have your hand upon your people and glorify your name in Jesus' name. Before we close out, I just want to be sure if there's anyone who's listening today and you've never asked Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, it's the key to everything. To receive forgiveness from God for all of the wrong that you've done in your life. To get a brand new start with him. God loves you. He loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die and pay the penalty for your sins. There's none of us perfect, none of us righteous. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And the wage of sin, the penalty of it, is to, is to be eternally separated from God. The wage of sin is death, that's separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life to them who would believe. The apostle would write, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if, you've, if you don't have that certainty that things are right between you and God, then pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you and others. Father, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my unrighteousness. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the price for my sin. He rose again from the dead so that I could have a new life. I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, let me encourage you. Put a post on the, on the uh, website or shoot me an email or a message so that I can reach out to you and share some things that will help you to grow. I hope that you'll come and be with us the first weekend in June. Uh, we're reopening this church for public services. We're going to have limited seating available Saturday night and Sunday morning. And if you want to come, go on our church website, go on our church Facebook page, uh, or call the church office and make a reservation for what service and how many people are coming with you to that service so that we can be sure we can accommodate you. We have an opportunity to make reservations for all the services in June. So we hope that you'll do that and you'll join us. And we look forward to seeing you. God bless you. Go in peace till we gather again. Follow hard after the Lord and love on somebody in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I just declare that what you've sown in tears, you will weep in joy. He's turning your mourning into dancing. He's turning your sorrow into
to joy. Come on, clap your hands. Come on. 